間プラスぐらいをメドにしてやりました、ね、<笑>パート2えっ、ー、とパート2と3でプラス1時間ぐらいプラス1時間えどういう意味最にあの通常だと12時までで終わりだったんですけど、うんまあ、午後1時間ぐらいは旦那さんに、うんやってもらえ終わらないと思う<笑><笑>あでも本当は2時間あるから1時間、はい、1時間やると押すっていうようにしといてでもマックス2時間までは取れるどうせるから多分多分オート発表の皆さんも多分押しますので So we'd like to restart the part 2 until 12 o'clock、mm -hmm. and、uh, we will have a more one hour in the afternoon Uh, for your presentation in a part three.、Oh. Mm -hmm. are, you sure you, are you sure you want to hear more? <laughs> yes, yes. No, no, one, one hour more buffer. And, uh, and uh, if the、uh, uh, time is、uh, limited, I have to ask somebody to skip the presentation.、Mm -hmm. It's okay. It's a rare chance to hear you your、yes. presentation. <laughs> Okay, so, so please go on. In fact, the, you know, in the six previous Typhoon seminars, every lecturer was running out of time. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so, no worry.、Uh, all right, well, let's get started again.、Um, so, what was I talking about?、Uh, so, I wanted to show you some, some figures from、uh, the study that I, I did with.、Uh, Uh, my colleague Fuji n g a n g at Penn State,、um, looking at uh, simulations uh, of uh, Hurricane Earl、um, and observations of Hurricane Earl. And、uh, Earl in 2010 was a, a strong, became a strong Category 4 tropical cyclone.、Um, and Earl was one of the most、uh, comprehensively and intensively sampled tropical cyclones that, that we have. Um, it was observed by the Air Force, by NOAA,、uh, by NASA as part of the GRIP field campaign. So there's、uh, a lot of observations of Earl、um, throughout its life cycle. So it's a great case to study.、Um, and so the upper left here is、um, a satellite montage、um, from、uh, University of Wisconsin SIMS、um, uh, that just shows the track of the observed Earl and、uh, the Infrared satellite images at various times throughout Earl's life cycle. So you can see it developing from a, a weak tropical storm、um, to a hurricane. You can, in some of these, you can see an eye that's developed. So I'm going to be、um, showing simulation and some observations from sort of the middle of Earl's life cycle,、um, starting where、uh, they, in the period of rapid intensification, as Earl becomes、um, a hurricane from a tropical storm. And the warm core intensifies.、Um, the, this top right plot is,、um, shows the observed best track location of Earl、uh, in yellow, and then the wharf forecast that I'm showing you、um, is in blue.、Um, so, in this case, it shows a case that had a relatively good forecast of the track.、Uh, the contours, the colors here, is, is the sea surface temperature in degrees Celsius. So, Earl was, was going over a region of, of, of very warm SSDs of 28, 29 degrees、um, over a large area. So, it's a very、uh, favorable environment for an intense tropical cycler.、Um, the bottom plot here on the left is the maximum 10 meter wind speed in knots and the minimum、uh, surface pressure.、Uh, the, the best track on these plots is in magenta and then The wharf forecast is、um, in blue. And there are four flights that I analyzed from the,、uh, the NASA DC 8、um, that flew at、um, I think 13 kilometers or so,、uh, maybe 14 kilometers. And it flew through、um, the center of Earl, and from that we can analyze the warm core. And、uh, the four flights、uh, are indicated, the times of those flights are indicated by these vertical、uh, black dash lines.、Um, so, this is a, a fairly good forecast of, of Earl's intensity.、Um, and that's why I chose this case to analyze, because if you're going to try to understand the warm core structure、um, for a real case,、uh, you need the, 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 the intensity evolution to be well forecast, because otherwise, Uh, the temperature is just going to be way off from reality and it, it, it won't be easy to compare.、Uh, 
So you want to choose a case that's already a good forecast. Um, so in this case, the maximum wind speed uh, is uh, within about 10 knots at most times, so about five meters per second of what we think is the truth from the best track estimate. Um, so the first flight um, is uh, in a period uh, where the storm is just becoming a hurricane, it's rapidly intensifying, and then the next day um, it's a category three uh, or four major hurricane, um, uh, maybe intensifying, uh, maybe a little bit steady there, and then the third day, it's uh, near peak intensity. The storm has re-intensified um, after an eyewall replacement cycle. Um, and then on the last day, the storm is weakening as it's starting to recurve. Um, and the, the key point here is that the minimum pressure is very well forecast. And that's necessary for the warm core evaluation because the minimum pressure is going to be consistent hydrostatically with the integrated temperature profile. Um, so that means the integrated temperature profile is about the same between, or must be the same between the observations and the simulation. Um, and so then we can look at the details of the vertical structure to see how well uh, they compare. Um, and yeah, again, the minimum pressure the, of the forecast and the observations are usually within about five to 10 millibars of each other. So um, uh, in this, this study, I have uh, a number of different analyses of the uh, perturbation temperature structure from the drop suns and from the simulation. And so this is just uh, a, a one um, comparison that I did. Uh, this shows the perturbation temperature versus height. Um, in this case, I am using, I'm defining the perturbation temperature as the local environment of the storm. So um, based on, um, for the observations based on the NOAA G4 flights that flew in the environment um, between, uh, I believe I chose a four to 700 kilometers radius. Um, and then I did sample the simulation um, in a similar way. And so the environment there is the azimuthal mean of the 400 to 700 kilometer um, uh, radius of the, of the temperature. So that defines the environmental temperature that I subtract from the actual temperature to get the <coughs> perturbation temperature. So I'm, I'm comparing the environment, I'm comparing the, the forecast and the observations um, in a similar manner. So each, um, each solid colored line is, um, is an I sounding uh, from the DC8 of the, the perturbation temperature. Um, and each, um, each line here is a different day. So the 29th, which is the first flight, the storm's rapidly intensifying and is weakest, that's the solid blue line. And then that can be compared to the dashed blue line, which is the wharf, the, uh, the analysis of the perturbation temperature um, in wharf at that time. And so um, there's some, so there's some uh, differences. The, the wharf uh, uh, temp perturbation temperature is, is warmer at, at most heights. Um, and if you go back to the um, minimum pressure, that's consistent with the fact that the, uh, that the minimum pressure in the forecast is slightly stronger, a slightly lower pressure than in the best track. So that's consistent with there being <coughs> a slight warm bias at most levels. However, um, <coughs> the broad scale structure is, is pretty well reproduced. Um, in particular, we have this uh, a broad region of, uh, of of warming in the of warmth in the observations, uh, with a maximum at about eight kilometers, but but very broad and a little change between um, five and ten kilometers. And this is true in the uh, wharf forecast as well. Um, if we go to the next day, uh, about 24 hours later. Um, Recall this is a period where the storm, where the observed storm is category four. Um, the simulated storm is a little bit weaker, but very strong. Um, the pressure um, is almost exactly the same between the simulation and the observations. Um, so that's these, the black line 
is the observed uh, high sounding. Um, so there's uh, there's a clear there's a mid-level maximum about four kilometers, um, a broad profile maybe another uh, maximum at eight kilometers. And if we look at the black dashed line, which is the wharf sounding at the same time, um, the, the the structure is overall very similar, and the, as are the the magnitudes. Um, and it's a little bit more smooth in the in the wharf forecast, but you can see that there's a tendency for sort of this this maximum at five four to five kilometers, and then this this um, another peak at about eight kilometers. So the details of the structure. Um, several days ahead of time are, are, are pretty well forecast, actually. Um, and uh, if you go to uh, the next flight on the first, so there's a 36-hour gap between flights here. Um, there was an eye wall replacement in the, um, in the forecast, or sorry, there was an eye wall replacement in the observations that wasn't actually well forecast. So there's some changes, there's evolution that, that um, we don't have a perfect forecast three, four days into a simulation. Um, but still, um, broadly, the structure um, is similar. There's a rapid, comparing the solid red line to the dashed red line, there's a, there's a rapid increase in the perturbation temperature with height to about four or five kilometers. And then it's um, mostly constant with height. Uh, there's um, a, a broader maximum in the simulation um, nearly constant with height in the observations. There's a, there's a warm bias in the simulation. It's several degrees too warm at mid-levels compared to the observed sounding. Um, if we look back at the pressure, um, you can see that, uh, that the forecast um, pressure is, is actually um, slightly too weak compared to the, the best track. Um, so that's not consistent with the with the, the with the forecast uh, warming being stronger. So what that means is that um, is that uh, above the level that we're sampling, uh, the the forecast temperature must actually be too cold. But we're not sampling that, and you can sort of see a. Um, a hint of that here at the top of the profile, the uh, simulated sounding is colder than the observed, and above the levels that we're sampling, there must be a cold bias there. But overall, for a, a, a four-day forecast, this is a pretty good structure. Um, and then finally, the last day that was that was sampled on on the second, um, the green line. There's some missing data here, but uh, you can inferred that there should be a maximum at about four to five kilometers um, that um, is somewhat resolved in the simulation, but it's much smoother. But still, overall, there's a fairly good comparison um, quantitatively and qualitatively um, between the observed um, warm pore structure and the simulated warm pore structure. Um, and so the final part of, of this talk that I have planned is to have some slides to try to um, make clear that it's actually really difficult to relate changes in the vertical structure of the worm core to changes in the, uh, the wind field structure. Even though by thermal wind balance they are very well related, they're not related in a, in a conceptually simple way. Um, and the next few slides might get confusing, so if something doesn't make sense, please ask. So this, these here, I'm showing you, um, these are, this is all going to be from the simulation at this point. So this is the, the simulated um, perturbation temperature field um, on consecutive days, uh, 24 hours apart. Um, so this is going to correspond to um, the red and, and, and the green lines. So, um, and, and in this period, recall, sorry, I'll go back here. Um, that's between this, this, this time, uh, between 96 hours and 120 hours. So in both the best track 
and the, the forecast, there's, there's uh, a rapid weakening of the storm in the, in the wind and then um, somewhat in the, in the pressure, although um, in the forecast, the pressure difference is not actually that pronounced. Um, the pressure is nearly constant between these two times. Um, but there's a substantial change in the warm core structure. Uh, so going from September 2nd to September 3rd, uh, the mid-level maximum that's originally at six kilometers weakens substantially. Um, and then the absolute maximum on the third is up at 10, 11 kilometers height. So you have a shift in the warm core from mid to upper levels. Um, and that, that's from, so you get a cooling at mid levels um, and a warming at, at upper levels. And on the bottom is the azimuthal mean tangential wind for these two times. And you'll notice you, you get a, a substantial weakening of the peak winds in the boundary layer and also an expansion. So the RMW expands at a low level from 40 to 50 kilometers. And following this time, there's a very a large expansion um, towards the 100 kilometers another day later. Um, and even though the wind field is expanding and weakening at this time, uh, the, the minimum pressure is actually staying about the same in the simulation. So these two warm cores, these have the same surface pressure. So you can get a wide variety of, uh, for the same integrated warming, which would correspond to the, the minimum surface pressure, you can have a wide variety of structures consistent with that warming. So, um, as I said, so this on the upper left is the 24 hour change in temperature. So the difference between the temperature field of those two times. <laughs> And so consistent with uh, a, a shift in the warm core maximum from mid-levels to upper levels, uh, that's, that's due to a region of cooling um, in most of the eye between about four and eight kilometers. And then there's warming between eight and 16 kilometers. So that's going to shift the warm core upwards. Um, and on this plot, I, I'm showing uh, the RMW at the two times. So the blue line is at the earlier time and the magenta is later. So you can see there's a, a sh outward shift in the RMW. Um, again, the minimum pressure stays nearly constant when this, for this, this the warming at upper levels offsets the cooling at low levels in an integrated sense. Um, the wind field is expanding. So that's, this is on the right as the 24 hour change in the tangential wind. Um, so you have a very large negative tendency where the RMW was before um, and very, a very substantial positive tendency uh, away from the eye wall as the, the wind field expands, <coughs> but the maximum is weakening. Um, and there's not actually an obvious direct relationship between these fields. Again, in, in, the, in the globally integrated sense, they're, they're related, um, but it's difficult to say I don't think you can say that just the upward shift in the warm core, um, that this pattern of cooling and warming would necessarily be associated with, um, with a weakening of the storm or an expansion of the storm. Um, and I'm going to try to explain uh, why you can't say that um, in the following slides. So what I'm really talking about here is, is what does thermal wind balance actually tell us about the structure of the storm? So uh, up here, this is a, an equation for thermal wind balance um, from Schubert et al. This is based on the, um, uh, in the a log pressure height coordinate system, which makes things simpler. Um, but you could basically think about this as physical height. It's, it's nearly the same. Um, so. Um, so basically, this is relating, um, as we know, the, the vertical uh, gradient of the tangential wind, um, or really the vertical gradient of the gradient wind, um, to the radial gradient of the temperature. And this T naught is a constant temperature, so this, this isn't important, um, and G is gravity. Um, but um, an important concept here is that the radial temperature gradient is not directly proportional to the vertical wind uh, speed gradient, there's this 2V over R term. 
So the radius is actually important, and it's actually, and this other 